This week, it's tobacco control musical chairs, lobbyist scandals, cigarette smuggling, and vape war propaganda exposed. Ain't nothing to it but to get into it. I'm DJ Alex, and this is your Hunky Vape Global 20 Vape Science Advocacy News for the week ending 12 August 2022. In what is now the second immediate website scrubbing this month, the Truth Initiative, who we are, slash our team, David Dobbins page, no longer exists. Yes, Truth Initiative Chief Operating Officer David Dobbins no longer works for the Truth Initiative, and he's not the only one to leave Truth Initiative this week. Michael Corsi, the guy who led marketing strategy and youth engagement for the past six years, has also left Truth Initiative to become the marketing director at Central Ohio Transit Authority. What a tangled web we weave. With over 222 employees and on a mission to create a culture where youth people reject smoking, vaping, and nicotine, this master settlement agreement derivative company is constantly evolving to expand their web of tobacco control into philanthropic level distribution of assets just to get everyone to see things their way especially on the national opioid abuse epidemic, which they added to their mission in 2018. And if that's not enough, Truth Initiative is a leader in tobacco control research and policy with a strong team of research scientists in our Schroeder Institute for Tobacco Research and Policy Studies. What? You never heard about the Schroeder Institute for Tobacco Research and Policy Studies? Nope. Neither have I until just this past week. But it gets even more interesting. The Schroeder Institute receives federal support to conduct intervention and policy relevant research, including large scale, nationally funded studies. The Schroeder Institute is also integral to the evaluation and coordination of training and research in tobacco regulatory science, serving as part of a federal coordinating center. The Schroeder Institute produces in-house research, commissions rapid response research to address priority topics, contributes to federal docket submissions on an ongoing basis, and convenes and coordinates meetings among experts to inform policy, FDA regulation, and practice in youth prevention and adult smoking cessation. Hmm. I wonder if this has anything to do with Dr. Steve Schroeder at the University of California, San Francisco. Dr. Schroeder is Distinguished Professor of Health and Healthcare, Division of General Internal Medicine, Department of Medicine, UCSF, where he also heads the Smoking Cessation Leadership Center. The center, funded by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and the Truth Initiative, works with leaders of more than 80 American health professional organizations and healthcare institutions to increase the cessation rate for smokers. It has expanded the types of clinician groups that support cessation, developed an alternative cessation message, ask, advise, refer, created new ways to market toll-free telephone quit lines, and engaged the mental health and addictions treatment community for the first time. The center's current work is focused especially on how to reduce the huge health burden from smoking that falls upon those with mental illness and or substance abuse disorders. Pay attention, folks. Smoking Cessation Leadership Center works collaboratively with SAMHSA, 
That's the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration dot gov. HRSA, which is the Health Resources and Services Administration, another dot gov, the CDC, and multiple health professional groups to provide technical assistance to help strengthen smoking cessation capabilities. The center also facilitated summit meetings involving 18 states that conduct tobacco cessation summits, enabling states to achieve targeted reductions in smoking rates among behavioral health populations. Steve Schroeder formerly chaired the American Legacy Foundation now known as Truth Initiative. See what happens when you follow the money? What a tangled web they weave. When I first started looking into Truth Initiative, it made no sense how an organization with $57.7 million of revenue expensed $109 million that year and still has over $770 million dollars in assets. In fact, their executive board makes a combined total of $3.8 million, according to the IRS 990 information. The CEO of Truth Initiative, Robin Caval, makes almost $750,000, and the chief financial officer makes over half a million dollars. Yet, M. David Dobbins will no longer collect his $394,665 salary. Where is Truth Initiative former COO and Associate General Counsel David Dobbins going? I haven't been able to figure it out out yet, but I will update you when the information becomes publicly available. Moving on to the next tobacco control research, musical chair this week. Christine Del Nevo, appointed chair of FDA Tobacco Products Scientific Advisory Committee. Except she wasn't just appointed to the FDA TPSAC. She was appointed in March of 2021. So why all the fuss and this public announcement from Rutgers University in New Jersey? Something just doesn't add up here until you realize her work has been extensively cited in two FDA proposed rules that would ban menthol in cigarettes and characterizing flavors in cigars. And she recently served as an external peer reviewer on the FDA scientific assessment of the impact of menthol in cigarettes. All of a sudden now, this all makes sense. The government wants to ban menthol in all tobacco products. And yes, folks, that means they wanna ban mint and menthol in vaping products too. Even though the FDA hasn't authorized any flavor besides tobacco, They want to make sure their people side with the government's current position before anyone gets appointed. So naturally, she's the best pick for the position and why they're making hay about a pick that happened last year. Is this the reason there was such a change of position within the FDA? Is this why Matt Holman's statements that there will be a diverse flavor profile to allow smokers an off-ramp from the combustion highway never saw the light of day? Is Rutgers going to be getting a massive cash infusion and suddenly jump aboard the complete prohibition bandwagon for tobacco control? How about we take a closer look at Christine Del Nevo and all the publications that she's put out there, because I know for a fact I've seen her name before. 
Just following the link in her Rutgers profile, we find that she's published over 100 papers, one of which we just talked about not that long ago. Over one year later, Smokers of Ollie Awareness Knowledge and Perceived Impact on E-Cigarette Interest. The E-Cigarette, a vaping product use associated lung injury, a volley outbreak caused serious lung injuries in over 2,800 people in the United States in 2019. By February 2020, most cases were determined as linked with vaping tetrahydrocannabinol, THC, including black market products using vitamin E acetate. This study examined smokers of Ollie awareness, knowledge, and perceived impact on their e-cigarette interest approximately 16 months after its peak. Results? Approximately 54% of smokers had heard of a volley. Among those who had heard of a volley, number 542, 37.3% believed its main cause was e-cigarettes used to vape nicotine. Like Jewel, fewer, 16.6%, thought the main cause was products for vaping marijuana slash THC and 20.2% did not know. About 29% had heard vitamin E acetate was associated with a volley, and 50.9% indicated a volley made them less interested in using electronic cigarettes in the future. A volley awareness was significantly associated with e-cigarette misperceptions, i.e. that e-cigarettes are just as harmful as smoking. <laughs> Conclusions? Despite the passage of time, considerable lack of knowledge and misperceptions about a volley remain among those who smoke. Our findings suggest the need for continued effort to promote better understanding of a volley and appropriate behavioral and policy responses. Did you get the gist of the study, folks? 50.9% indicated a volley misperceptions decreased their interest in vaping to quit smoking. So it's no wonder Rutgers Today published a more balanced public health approach is needed for e-cigarette use. Researchers at Rutgers seek balanced policies to ensure the devices are available for those who want to kick the cigarette smoking habit but don't serve as a gateway to smoking or nicotine addiction. How can we strike this balance? Chen Sankei said, there are several policy advances and strategies that may be helpful in ensuring that the net public health benefit of e-cigarettes and e-cigarette use is not eclipsed by its harm. For instance, the recent authorization of e-cigarette products by the U.S. Food and Drug Administration through its PMTA pathway may help to establish public trust in authorized e-cigarette products. The FDA is also likely to authorize certain e-cigarettes as modified risk tobacco products, which may help encourage smokers to see e-cigarettes as a tool to stop smoking combustible cigarettes. Bover Mandersky said, additionally, to boost combustible cigarette smokers' acceptance of using e-cigarettes for smoking cessation, public health education and mass media communication strategies should focus on evidence-based results pertaining to the reduced harm associated with switching to electronic cigarettes. Why do you think some adults who smoke combustible cigarettes have turned away from vaping as a means to quitting? Over the past five years or so, e-cigarette products have become less appealing to combustible smokers interested in quitting, but more appealing to people who have never smoked. A few factors can explain this discouraging pattern. For one, local and national policies intended to reduce use of e-cigarettes among youths may simultaneously reduce adult smokers' interest and use of e-cigarettes when attempting to quit. Additionally, the media may have altered smokers' understanding of vaping. 
because of the substantially higher volume of media coverage of vaping risks for youth compared with the potential benefits of vaping for adult combustible cigarette smokers. It's also likely that public health groups and healthcare professionals may have emphasized the risks of vaping over for use over the potential benefits for adults who use combustible tobacco. In other words, the massive campaigns to prevent youth vaping have resulted in smokers' reluctance to try vaping. Combine that with the FDA only authorizing 21 never heard of before products from three big tobacco companies. And we have a complete failure for public health. In addition, nicotine risk misperceptions among U.S. physician study reveals the true extent to which the misinformed public permeates society. Nurses had misperceptions about nicotine replacement. 60% believe that nicotine causes cancer. And it doesn't. 72% believe that nicotine patches could cause heart attacks. And it won't. But doctors' misperceptions were even worse. The majority of physicians strongly agreed the nicotine directly contributes to the development of cardiovascular disease. 83.2% thought that. COPD. 80.9% thought that. And cancer. 80.5% of doctors incorrectly think that nicotine causes cancer. Over 80% of doctors do not understand nicotine and consequently can't accurately communicate risk in an evolving tobacco marketplace full of vaping products. Matter of fact, the latest Gallup poll shows Americans want stricter vaping regulations but are mixed on tobacco. No surprise, 61% of Americans want the laws on e-cigarettes to be made even more strict. The public supports lowering nicotine in cigarettes, but not a menthol ban. Well, of course that's what the misinformed public wants. They have no comprehension on nicotine or the idea of tobacco harm reduction and certainly don't know anything about successful smoking cessation. The only ones who understand how to quit smoking are those of you who used to smoke but found an easy way to quit smoking. It's the reason there are so many passionate vaping advocates out there. We don't get paid anything, yet spend countless hours and countless amounts of our own money preaching for the single best way to quit smoking. We tried the patches, we tried the gum, we tried all the failed pharmaceutical products available out there, even with all of their horrendous side effects. We know people who tried cold turkey and almost ended up killing their loved ones because of the withdrawal symptoms of going cold turkey. And we know people who took the prescription drug Champix or Chantix, depending on what country you live in, and got so depressed that they tried to commit suicide. And we know how comparatively easy it was to pick up a flavorful vape and accidentally stop smoking cigarettes. This country doesn't have a problem with nicotine consumption. I'm sorry. It has a mental illness problem and a lack of affordable health care to deal with depression and mental illness. It's exactly why Wellbutrin, an antidepressant prescribed for major depressive disorder, has now been remarketed as Zyban, a drug to help quit smoking. Sorry, folks, but cigarette smoking isn't the problem. It's the symptom 
documenting a person's coping mechanism to their life. If you don't provide an alternative source of someone's coping mechanism, their underlying problems will surface and for some may overtake their ability to cope with life. Tobacco control zealots need to realize that tobacco isn't an enemy to vanquish out of existence. Tobacco consumption is self-medication for a population who can't afford or doesn't know how to get proper mental health care. It's simply a coping drug like alcohol, caffeine, cannabis, or a bupropion. Which leads us to the next article from the Boston Globe. Vape Wars, the fierce debate over banning and unbanning of Juul e-cigarettes. Both e-cigarettes and combustible tobacco products fulfill one primary function. They're incredibly efficient delivery systems for nicotine. First banning Juul to combat youth vaping and then reversing course to further study the science represents an unprecedented division in the field of tobacco control. On one side, are those who focus on vaping's effects on young people and its potential role in creating a new generation of nicotine addicts. And on the other, are those concerned that headline-grabbing fears about vaping are obscuring its potential as a harm reduction tool. In reality, the negative effects of consuming nicotine are overwhelmingly related to how it gets into your bloodstream. With combustible products like cigarettes, this occurs when you inhale burning tobacco smoke into your lungs. That smoke also contains tar, carbon monoxide, and a number of known carcinogens. It's all the other stuff, essentially, everything but nicotine, that is the primary reason cigarettes are the leading cause of preventable death both in the United States and around the world. A significant body of evidence showing vaping is less harmful than smoking has not deterred those in the anti-nicotine space from their campaign against vaping. As the American Lung Association's Erica Schward put it to me, are we talking about the difference between jumping out of a 20-story versus an eight-story window? Well, here it is. Here's exactly where Erica Sward of the American Lung Association gets it all wrong. If smoking was equivalent to jumping out of a 20-story building, vaping would be equivalent to jumping out of the first-story window. Or if you were talking about exclusively cancer risk, walking out the front door onto the sidewalk. That's because science has already proven and Public Health England still maintains that vaping is unlikely to exceed 5% the harms of smoking. And for a 200-foot building, that's only 10 feet from the ground. And when talking cancer risk from vaping compared to smoking, the cancer risk is less than one half a percent. That's 0.5% the risk of a 205th building or one foot from the ground. That's literally walking out the front door of the building and taking one step onto the ground. Cancer Research UK states clearly on their webpage, is vaping harmful? Nicotine is the chemical that makes cigarettes addictive, but it is not responsible for the harmful effects of smoking. Nicotine does not cause cancer, and people have used nicotine replacement therapy safely for many years. Nicotine replacement therapy is safe enough to be prescribed by doctors. And I'll go even further than that. Nicotine replacement therapy is so safe, it's available in every convenience store and grocery store that chooses to carry it. 
and it's usually on the bottom shelf where even a toddler could pick up the box. We don't have a problem with that, but all of a sudden now, because it's in a vape, it becomes a problem. Nicotine replacement therapy, gums and patches come in all sorts of flavors. Yet, when we're talking about a vaping product, oh, you're not allowed to have flavors except tobacco. Why do you think the patches and the gums and the sprays in the grocery stores all come with flavors? Because you have to have a product somebody would choose to use. When you limit that to tobacco only flavor, nobody's going to use it because it's disgusting. Two Australian doctors are looking to teach Aussies what is actually inside vapes. Dr. Colin Mendelson says vaping is 95% less dangerous than smoking. Some people think vapor is more toxic than smoke. Well, that is wrong, he said. This estimate, 95% less dangerous, is based on comprehensive independent reviews of the scientific evidence by both Public Health England and the UK Royal College of Physicians. It is a reasonable guide to the general risk from vaping compared to smoking. Of course, the exact figure doesn't really matter, but saying the risk of vaping is probably less than 5% of smoking helps to communicate a ballpark for the level of risk so smokers can make an informed choice. Just saying the vaping is less harmful is just too vague. He went on to say, most of the harmful toxins in smoke are completely absent from vapor. Those toxins that are present are at much lower concentrations, mostly at levels below 1% of what they are in tobacco smoke. If toxins are much lower, the health risks will obviously be much lower. The risk of cancer from vaping has been independently estimated to be under 0.5% of the risk of smoking. Dr. Mendelssohn believes an ideal approach with vaping should be a balance between making high quality vaping products readily available to adult smokers while reducing access for young people. Dr. Alex Woodock pictured said GPs are scared to write scripts for nicotine liquid due to the exaggeration of its relatively minor risks. Australian Tobacco Harm Reduction Association board member, Dr. Alex Woodock, told Daily Mail Australia that there are several reasons why vaping has a bad reputation. And this was reflected by GPs scared to write a script for nicotine liquid. Only 240 of Australia's 31,000 general practitioners are prepared to write a script for nicotine liquid. You ask, why is the case? Dr. Woodock said, first, authorities have not tried to persuade GPs to do this or show them what they would have to do to write a script. And second, Mainstream media has published a string of news items and commentaries demonizing nicotine, exaggerating its relatively minor risks while ignoring the huge benefits for smokers, switching from deadly cigarettes to much safer vaping. Many doctors are worried about what might happen to them if they wrote a script and then got into trouble. Over 90% of Australian vapors obtain their supplies from the unregulated black market, which has expanded to meet growing demand, he said. You know, folks, we talked about that last week. The growing black market, happily supplied by criminal organizations, crime syndicates, and if we're going to be honest, a few determined ex-smokers who fully understand the public health potential that they wield by supplying the nicotine 
that ex-smokers need to lead a healthier life without combustion. I've got even more black market raids to talk about before this episode is over. But how about we just finish up this article first? Dr. Woodock said individuals wishing to quit smoking have found it difficult to find pharmacists prepared to prescribe nicotine liquid. More like prepared to dispense the nicotine liquid. And this is largely as a result of Health Minister Greg Hunt tightening restrictions last October. Around 21,000 Australians die each year from a smoking-related condition, while there have been no certain deaths attributed to vaping nicotine anywhere in the world, despite 82 million people now vaping nicotine in dozens of countries. Think about that for a moment, folks. Over 82 million people every single day vape to not smoke combustible tobacco. And there hasn't been a single person killed because of nicotine vaping. We talked earlier about Avali and how it was only in the U.S. And all of those were from black market contaminated THC carts filled with vitamin E acetate, a substance which is impossible to dissolve in nicotine e-liquid. Fundamental science teaches you oil and water do not mix. They cannot mix. They will separate. Oil floats to the top. Nicotine e-liquid is 100% water soluble. I covered that in the very first video on this channel. So how about we jump into a lobbyist scandal with a California lawmaker. California lawmaker faces scandal after lobbyist tweets about alleged affair. Assemblyman Health Flora, Republican from Rapon, is dealing with revelations of alleged extramarital affairs as he completes a third term misrepresenting the 12th Assembly District and now considers other ambitions. Emily Hughes, a lobbyist for the California Medical Association before she left her job in May, wrote about the relationship on Twitter. Assemblyman Health Flora supported Senate Bill 575, authored by fellow Valley legislator Anna Caballero, to increase taxes on electronic cigarette and vaping products and opposed Senator Richard Pan Senate Bill 510, ensuring coverage for costs of COVID-19 testing. According to Open Secrets, a research group that tracks money in politics, the healthcare sector has contributed the most to Flora's election campaigns a total of $386,750 since 2016. The California Medical Association has been the largest health sector contributor to Flora, who has received $34,600 from the lobbying group. The sixth highest source of funding for Flora from a single contributor. Hughes 34 said her own reason for tweeting about the relationship is just to show constituents the other side of this assemblyman. Some who closely follow politics said that the revelations are more than just juicy gossip. As easily confirmed by Flora's wife, Melody, who filed for divorce in April in San Joaquin County Superior Court. Is your elected representative violating ethics codes, accepting campaign contributions while voting for increased taxes on harm reduction products? Or are they simply ignorant like 80% of American doctors? Well, the only way to find out is for you to get involved. 
contact your elected officials and let them know how you feel about vaping. Let them know how it empowered you to quit smoking and insist that they represent your interests in government. It all starts with a conversation and it's up to each and every one of us to change public health messaging. U.S. public health messaging is guiding consumers toward smoking. A new American Cancer Society study suggests that public health community should be more careful about the messaging it delivers on the differences in harm between combustible tobacco and vaping products. Listen, folks, I know I'm running long again. So here's the down and dirty summary. The number of Americans who believe vaping is more harmful than smoking doubled from 2019 to 2020. There simply isn't enough of us teaching the facts to counteract the misinformation out there. So I'm asking you, like I do every episode, please become an advocate and help save lives. Which leads me to warn you, panel discussion reveals increased abuse amongst THR advocates. A panel discussion led by renowned public health expert and researcher, Dr. Constantinos Farsalinos, revealed the increasing personal, derogatory, and defamatory public attacks on tobacco harm reduction advocates. The positive results achieved via THR are worth the fight. And if you were wondering why there wasn't a live show on this channel last week, well, it's because I spent most of the last week updating and securing the Hunky Vape website. It seems a hacker from Germany tried to use cross-site scripting to send emails from my website. These actions lock the mail server as soon as the first email bounced into oblivion. And what baffles me the most is that there's absolutely nothing on the website that isn't publicly available elsewhere. I don't make any money from this advocacy. There are no hidden treasures of information to be gained on this website. I am 100% self-funded and the only Patreon that I've had is Flavors. Long story short, the website has now been completely updated and fully secured. And I will be doing a live show this week. In fact, I had to spend an entire day completely redoing OBS to allow using Zoom subscription that I've purchased through the Patreon support of Flavors to host guests on the live shows. First time I tried to set it up, OBS crashed. Because apparently you're not allowed to take and use the camera instance in multiple locations. Regardless, I completely redid all the scenes in OBS. So there will be a live show this week. And if I have a guest available, it will be on the show. Amongst the other amount of work that I had to do this week, after two years of being on YouTube, I finally filled up the four hard drives that are in my computer. So I had to transfer a full terabyte of video files to an external drive, which means now I got to get another hard drive because just a matter of time before that's full again. Long story short, folks, I'm not going anywhere. And I'm going to keep doing this every single week. Be it these news shows once a week, I'm going to do the live mixing and chilling with Hunky Vape. I'm going to be doing product reviews for any products I can get my hands on. And I'm not going anywhere. Because these shows are about saving people's lives. Getting the truth out there that's already been scientifically proven. The message is consistent and will never change on this channel. Tobacco harm reduction works. And vaping saves lives. So, 
With that being said, let me recommend the advocate's voice. The truth will prevail. Even if you don't have time to watch this whole video, go click on the subscribe button. Nancy Lucas at CAFRA puts together an amazing The Advocate's Voice video that far exceeds anything that I've been able to make so far. But I will get there one day. All right. So last story for today comes from scoop.co.nz. Thankfully, the inconvenient truth about vaping has now landed on the laptops of Australians smashing the alarmist anti-vaping propaganda health agencies and officials are peddling since Nancy Lucas, executive coordinator of CAFRA, which is the Coalition of Asia Pacific Tobacco Harm Reduction Advocates. Ms. Lucas comments, fellow Australian tobacco harm reduction expert, Dr. Colin Mendelson, launching a series of eight short evidence-based videos on vaping to combat the misinformation by Dr. Carl Trushlinky for Queensland Health. Queensland, New South Wales, and Western Australia are throwing a lot of public money at untruthful anti-vaping campaigns. Subsequently, adult smokers in Australia are being actively discouraged from switching to the less harmful product and to less harmful nicotine alternatives. Dr. Call's vape truths are well worth the watch and completely expose Australia's indefensible anti-vaping position. Dr. Mendelssohn's eight-part video series reveals that vapor is far less toxic than cigarette smoke. Vaping significantly reduces the risk of cancer relative to smoking, and there has never been a single death caused by vaping nicotine. When smokers switch to vaping, their breathing improves substantially, and most of the chemicals in vapor are present at very low doses. And most cause little to no harm whatsoever. So, go check out his website, Dr. Call's Vape Truths. Web address is https Colin Mendelson, C O L I N M E N D E L S O H N dot C O M dot A U slash Dr. D R hyphen C O L S hyphen V A P E hyphen truths. And if you couldn't follow what I was saying, there's a link in the description below. Go check it out. While you're down there, you can check out the other link from New Zealand's health ministry. I posted it on Twitter earlier this week, but you can literally go see what it's like when a patient in New Zealand goes to see their doctor and has a conversation about vaping. Well, That wraps up the Global 20 Vape Science Advocacy News for the week ending August 12th, 2022. I sincerely appreciate all of you who stuck through another really long episode this week. Unfortunately, the illegal cigarette seizures that happened in Hong Kong, Manila, Ukraine, Manitoba, Penang, and India, well, they're going to have to wait until next time. I hope all of you have a fantastic week. And my wish is always peace, love, and a hunky vape to end cigarette combustion. Have a great day, folks. Stop.